Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. You can imagine I get a lot of jokes and a lot of jokes surrounding our family. One of my favorites of the more recent jokes is there was a story of a brewing convention. And at the end of the day, various of the heads of the breweries of the world met to have a, a drink after business. And the head of Bush was there and he ordered a Bud Light. Pete Coors was there, who's a good friend of mine, and he ordered a Coors Light. They came round to the chairman of Guinness and asked what he wanted, and he ordered a Coke. And they all looked at him puzzled, and they said, well, why aren't you drinking your family stout? He said, well, you guys didn't order real beer, so I didn't either. <laughs> now, my friends tell that story to remind me that there is no Guinness light. <laughs> Whether it's... Uh, beer or ideas, but fortunately we're at Stanford where you expect something serious, unlike some other audiences. It's a real pleasure to be back. The last time I was here, I happened to mention in the beginning that while I'm a very loyal alumnus of Oxford University, this university is my favorite university in all American universities. And for a year or two afterwards, I got letters from all over the place complaining that I was picking out Stanford as my favorite university. So I'm back, and it is, and it's a real pleasure to be here again. <laughs> Thank you. Nineteen eighty-nine, the year that the Soviet Union fell, was described as the year of the century. Many of you here tonight probably were not taking a great interest in public affairs those years ago. But any of us who can remember 1989 probably has our favorite memories of that extraordinary year. The joyous dismantling of the Berlin Wall. Flowers jauntily poking out of Soviet gun barrels. The toppling of the statuary of the men gods, Marx and Lenin and Stalin. But for me, the favorite pictures of that year, the favorite image, was night after night in November 1989, when more than a third of a million every night packed into Wenceslav Square, Prague, to listen to a short, boyish, mustachioed, then dissident, now president, Václav Havel. And again and again, he painted the contrast between the velvet revolutionaries and the Soviets. And the very quick-witted Czech crowd picked up a chant, we are not like them. We are not like them. Some of the contrast was the violence, and the velvet revolution would not reply with violence to violence. But another of the contrasts in the course of the week was they, the Soviets, were people of lies and propaganda. And they, the revolutionaries, were people of truth. The Charter 77 movement had as its motto, truth prevails for those who live in truth. Just a few years earlier, Alexander Solzhenitsyn had electrified the world with his line, the old Soviet Russian proverb, one word of truth outweighs the entire world. Now, as you look back on that, you realize how they were aware there were only two ways that they could bring down the Soviets. Either they had to trump Soviet power with equal or more power, and they were a handful of dissidents, unthinkable. Or they had to counter Soviet power with another type of power altogether, and that's what they did, the power of truth. Truth prevails for those who live in truth. And the unthinkable happened, they won. Now as we look around Europe, and certainly the United States today, particularly in many of our elite intellectual establishments, we have to say that while all over the West when that happened, P. 
people applauded this tremendous courage and this principal stand. And yet in many parts of America, there isn't a similar solid view of truth on which anyone could make such a stand today. You can see assaults, confusion surrounding the notion of truth, so the truth is seen as dead. Anyone who believes in an objective truth or an absolute truth is Neanderthal and reactionary, and truth at very best is relative. All depends on the interpretation, all depends on the perspective. At worst, it's socially constructed. It's a testament to the community that said it and made it stick and the power they had in expressing it. And you can see that many people today who stand for a solid traditional view of truth, shall we say for the moment, are considered very reactionary, if not far worse, arrogant, exclusive, and thoroughly wrong-headed. I want to argue tonight that this crisis of truth is enormously important both for individuals as well as for the American Republic. That far from being Neanderthal and reactionary, truth is a very precious, simple, fundamental human gift without which we cannot negotiate reality and handle life. So the truth is absolutely essential for a good human life. And equally importantly, truth is absolutely essential for freedom. And in the American Republic, where the challenge is not just becoming free, but sustaining freedom, any people who would be free and remain free have to grapple seriously with the real challenge of truth. Let me do it in the time we have an enormously complicated and controversial subject by just outlining a series of pairs that introduced us to some of the themes that need to be thought through. First of all, two companion crises to the crisis of truth. Secondly, two arguments for those who actually do believe in truth but have grown rather careless about it. Thirdly, two arguments for those who are radically skeptical about truth and have no interest in it. And then lastly, two challenges that truth brings to us all even if we're deeply committed to a solid view of truth. Let me begin, though, with two companion crises to the crisis of truth. Because what you see as you look at the American Republic is that the present crisis of truth has gone hand in hand with a crisis of character and a crisis of ethics. And together, these three are a very serious erosion of what was once considered essential to this nation. First, the crisis of character. Back in 1979 in Guatemala, a little town called Chahul, not very big in the world's map, the whole town was herded into the public square one day to witness the execution of 23 Marxist guerrillas who'd been captured by the Guatemalan army. And as the story went, they were stood up and a soldier explained to the crowd how each of the hideous wounds had been given. Another soldier took a pair of scissors and cut all their clothes off and left them naked. And then other soldiers came and bludgeoned them with bayonets to the ground, poured kerosene over them, and they were burnt alive, writhing hideously till they died. All over Europe in the 13 years following that, the sister of a 16-year-old who was one of them told the story in conferences and all sorts of packed audiences, and usually ending with a incredibly dramatic crisis, and the spotlight would be on her alone, and many people would be in tears. And the red carpet was rolled out, the Pope invited her, royal heads of state invited her, and then in 1992, to climax it all, she was given the Nobel Prize over Václav Havel and various people who were also candidates that same year. 1992, 500 years on from Christopher Columbus, how extraordinarily appropriate that a young native Mayan Indian woman should be given the Nobel Peace Prize. 
standing up for the truth of her people. But then one of her supporters, an anthropology professor, investigated it, and in his words, decided after looking at the facts, she should have been given the Nobel Prize for fiction, not peace, because much of the story was concocted. Much of it was true. Now her parents had been killed by the police. Her brother had been killed by the army, but not in that way. No one had actually been burnt alive in the town square in Chahul. Now, when the professor said this, a firestorm of outrage came on him. He was imposing his Western journalistic views of veracity on this Native American woman who's lived in a different world. And after all, she was expressing the larger truth of her people. She had the victim's right to lie, you name it, it went on. A left-wing example, undoubtedly, and you can find examples across the board today, left, right, and center, of what's now loosely called creative invention or creative reinvention. And you can see when it comes to character today how in the last hundred years there's been a profound sea change in American culture. Truth is dead, character is dead, and we can create whatever image we want for ourselves. Now, this is clearly different. Go back to the Greeks, Plato, or Aristotle, or to the Bible. Character was the inner stuff that made a man or woman what he or she was the inner form below all the external things like words, behavior, let alone personality and image. It was, in the biblical understanding, who a person is when no one sees except God. You can see that the traditional view of character is very much captured by Jesus' word, hypocrite, which before him was actually the Greek word for the actor someone who was playing a role which they weren't, and Jesus morally charges that as a hypocrite because it was not in line with what God sees of their character inside. Now, of course, there have been other voices, say Machiavelli. Character's nice, he says, but the bottom line is the survival of the prince. So whatever it takes, if you can be filled with good character, fine, but if you have to go another way, by all means be thoroughly evil if that means the survival of your rule. But you can see that those lone voices like Machiavelli's are now the general rule. What was behind this? Well, on the one hand, we've moved from the country to the city and from a few deep relationships to an enormous number of relationships and from words to images. So increasingly, the sense that the first impression is the only impression, face value is what counts, until we arrive down to the 50s and 60s and the whole art of impression management, where all that matters is the appearance, the perception is the reality, as the politicians say in Washington. All is the impression management, and each of us now is the impresario to our own images. So the notion of designer personality and so on and so on is very powerfully abroad in this country. So character is dead. And all that matters for many people today is image and appearance and packaging. As Mark Twain said, uh, in America, the secret of success is sincerity. You, got, you can fake that, you got it made. <laughs> or as Groucho Marx said, hey, these are my principles, my moral principles. And if you don't like them, I've got others. <laughs> In other words, there is no solid core today. It is only this world of appearances. And we can see in politics and in advertising in many, many areas how profoundly that has come in. Largely, I think, not a result of ideas, but a result of living in modern society with its mobility and media and so on. How about the other crisis? the crisis of ethics. Do you know the story of Shirley Howgard and her teaching, Shirley Jackson's, Kay Howgard and her teaching of Shirley Jackson's story, The Lottery, down in Pasadena? You may have done The Lottery in high school. Midwestern community, tremendous suspense building up, something crucial to the community is going to be enacted. Who knows what it is? And suddenly, with a stunning denouement, 
human sacrifice. When it was published in the New Yorker in 1948, there was a storm of outrage. Unthinkable, morally outrageous, and sackfuls of mail were received by the New Yorker in protest to its publication. K. Haugard, a teacher down in Pasadena, taught this over many, many years. When she began, she said, it was the 60s, and the first reactions were equally outrage, unthinkable, impossible here in America, human sacrifice. And then came Vietnam, and people came back with the stories of death and violence and maiming and the perversions they'd seen with prostitutes or whatever. And the whole discussion changed. And she described the various trends going through America until one summer's evening in the mid-1990s, 20 in the class, this story, which had always evoked a strong, passionate outrage, got none. What a neat ending, one person said, seeing it only in literary terms. Well, we believe in religious liberty and cultural differences, and hey, if this is their religious liberty, who am I to judge? And you name it. And by the end of the evening, she said, with more than 20 adults in the class, not a single one, and for the first time, she injected her own views trying to stir some discussion, not a single one would make any stand against any moral judgment. She said, on the warm California tonight, she left the classroom shivering, chilled to the bone. I've been on campuses where, to put it simply, Today, it is worse to judge evil than it is to do evil. Where the confusion, the uncertainty, the stress on tolerance and non-judgmentalism is such that with many groups, it is now worse to judge evil than it is actually to do evil, so profound is the ethical confusion. Now, in this case, it does go back largely to ideas. And there are many roots, of course, but one of the supreme ones would be Friedrich Nietzsche. If you know, I gather Dallas Willard, a very distinguished philosopher, was lecturing him the other night. I wish I'd heard it. Nietzsche, who was the self-proclaimed immoralist, antichrist, who called himself the old artilleryman, who delighted in doing philosophy with a hammer, he had his assault on truth and ethics from two sides. The first is the more obvious, what he called perspectivism. As Nietzsche says, there are many eyes, so there are many truths, in plural, so there is no truth. Everything is a matter of perspective, where you're coming from, how you see it, and race, class, gender, etc., are fundamental. But that's not actually the deepest assault of Nietzsche's on truth and ethics. It's what he calls the genealogy of morals. In other words, you take virtues, say pity or compassion, and behind these magnificent seeming virtues are actually sniveling vices dressing themselves up, using the virtues to express their power agendas so that the herd has control over the heroes, and the slave morality finally conquers the master morality. So strip away the genealogy, get down, down behind the family tree, don't look at anything as it seems to be, nothing is what it seems. And behind these great virtues are really vices, and behind everything, the will to power. Strip it all away, dismantle it, deconstruct it, and then you get down to the will to power. Very deadly assault on truth, so that both truth is dead in its objective sense, so that truth is dead, knowledge is only power. And certainly right and wrong are dead, and we're beyond good and evil in that sense. As I said, this is not universal in America, thank God. But you can see it in many places, including the academic world. Two companion crises. Secondly, let me move on to two arguments to people who actually do believe in truth, mostly, but are very careless about it, which is, on the one hand, many believers, and on the other hand, many citizens. Let me address two arguments to the believers first. There's a lower and a higher argument for truth. 
The lower argument for people who are believers and should be committed to truth is that unless there is truth in faith, faith is always vulnerable to the charge of either bad faith or poor and inadequate faith. Bad faith, particularly in the way, say, the French existentialists put it, is people who believe, say, in God, only because they're afraid of the alternative. They're afraid of the terror of meaninglessness or whatever. So, because of fear of the alternative, they believe in God. There are many answers to that profound objection to faith, but the deepest of them is simply no believer should believe because they're afraid of the alternative. That may make them think and care and search, but fundamentally there's only one final adequate re reason to believe because one is convinced that it is true. How about poor faith? There are many people in this country I've met who have extraordinary inadequate views of faith. They believe because it's true for them, which is relativism. Or they believe because they felt it and experienced it very deeply, which is subjectivism. Or they believe because, quote, it works for them, which is basically pragmatism. But for followers of Jesus, those are three fundamentally inadequate views. We do not believe relativism or pragmatism or subjectivism. The Christian faith, for example, is not true because it works. It works because it's true. And people who have that inadequate faith, very often it's because of bad teaching. Sometimes they use that lack of reason as a drawbridge to raise the portcullis against skepticism and questions and objections. In other words, as a way of escape, which is fundamentally dishonest. And once again, there's no answer either to bad faith or to poor versions of the faith without the notion of truth. But that's the lower reason for believers. The higher reason is that for both Jews and for Christians, and they would be exactly one here, the ultimate reason to believe in truth is not fancy philosophy, but solid theology. In other words, in the biblical family of faiths, unlike the secularist family or the Eastern family, truth is central to faith because God Himself is the true one. He who is a personal, infinite God is the true one, and He speaks truly, and He acts truly, and His words and deeds can be checked out in history. And so the notion of trustworthiness and truthfulness are very closely linked. And ultimately, truth for both Jews and followers of Jesus is finally a matter of who God is. But what about those who are not believers, just citizens who traditionally should believe in truth but don't? I think there are two arguments here. In this case, there are a negative argument and a positive argument. The negative argument's the simpler one and the more dramatic one, but the positive one's equally important. The negative argument is this. Without truth, there is only manipulation. In other words, many of our postmodern people suggest there's a brave new world, dismantle all these fancy claims to truth, and you get down to the fundamental agendas of power. So, just strip it all away and you're a great state, yes? If when you play your power game it's stronger than everyone else, you're in great shape. But what happens if you're weaker than others? If there's no truth, and truth is dead and knowledge is only power, then might makes right. The victory goes to the strong and the weak go to the wall. That, of course, was what Solzhenitsyn and Václav Havel were standing against. They did not have the power but they had truth, and because of truth, they would not and could not be manipulated. But that's true not only in the grand cosmic sense, like bringing down the Soviet Union. It's also true in all sorts of other ways. People, for example, who have a family member who's a tyrant emotionally, 
or a boss who's extremely controlling, or a professor who's thoroughly unfair in his manipulation. Whatever the situation is in human life, the only way to stand is on the basis of truth. And without truth, there's only manipulation. Extraordinary poignant example is Pablo Picasso. A genius of an artist, maybe, but a monster of a man in his relationships. His great friend, Alberto Giacometti, called him a monster. He devoured his friends. He devoured especially women, mistresses, and so on. He called himself the Minotaur, the classical monster who devoured maidens. One of his mistresses, Marie Therese, she said, he used to rape us and then paint. He himself said, when I die, and you remember, he died at 91 in 1973, he said, when I die, and he said this long before the filming of the Titanic, when I die, it will be like a great ship going down and many will go down with me. And when he did, three of those close to him committed suicide, unable to live without this devouring, consuming personality who was at the center of their lives in such a powerful way. But if you read the stories, only one was really able to stand with security, Francois Gillot. One of his mistresses, who was 40 years younger than Picasso, but she said, I would have to go into Pablo every day, like Joan of Arc, wearing the armor of truth. Without truth, there is only manipulation. A very simple argument, but a very powerful argument to people, because none of us like to be manipulated. And let's be clear, without truth, there is only power and all of us will be at the mercy of those stronger than us because the name of the game is manipulation. That's the negative argument. The more positive argument sounds a little more abstract, but equally important. Without truth, there is no freedom. When I was at Oxford, one of the grand old men still living then was Isaiah Berlin, the great Jewish philosopher. And again and again, I saw him sort of teasing American graduate students and he would say, you know, in America, you come across to England with only half of you of freedom. And they would look at him. And he would expound freedom with two dimensions, and he would say that most Americans only had one dimension. He said the same to the British, too. In other words, most people, for example, the archetypal teenager, would say that freedom is freedom from. A teenager is free from parents, from professors, from the police, from any parental supervision, and thinks that's free. Freedom from. And of course, that is a very vital part of freedom. Whenever there's tyrants and repressive authorities or whatever, becoming free from. But Berlin would point out that's only half of freedom. Freedom is not just freedom from, it's freedom for. As Lord Acton, the great Catholic historian, put it, it's not just the permission to do what we like, it's the power to do what we ought. Real freedom depends on knowing who we are, because we're most free when we're ourselves, as G.K. Chesterton says. You can free a tiger from its cage, but you can never free it from its stripes. Its stripes are part and parcel of what's the tiger. You can free the camel from the zoo, but for heaven's sake, don't free it from its hump. The hump is part and parcel of being a camel. In other words, you have to discover the truth, the character, the nature of what something is in order for it to be itself and to be free. You need to know the truth of what it is. And without truth, there is literally no freedom. Now, I suggest that many of our fellow citizens do sort of half-consciously believe in truth, but in a day when it's unpopular and now it's associated with religious totalitarianism and Osama bin Laden and so on, many people are ashamed to say that they believe in truth today, and we need to build back in some of these fundamental arguments for the importance of truth. But thirdly, let me move on to arguments for those who are much more radically skeptical about truth, who are opposed to truth, who are openly dismissive of truth in a very skeptical way. I think even here, 
there are two arguments that are very, very powerful. The first is negative, the second is positive. You could put it many ways, but I'll put it in the terms of my own mentor in the, uh, the social sciences, Peter Berger. The negative approach to the radical skeptic is, as Peter Berger says, to relativize the relativizers. People glory in relativism, but if you look at their relativism, there's usually a hidden double standard. They'll be skeptical about the past, but not the present. Or they'll be skeptical about everyone else, but not themselves. In other words, they don't apply the relativism to their own position. And Berger says you should relativize the relativize the relativizers. There's a clarity in consistency. And as people go out trying to be true to what they say they believe, they find they can't be. Because the simple fact is that while any thought can be thought and any argument can be argued, there are some thoughts that can be argued but not lived. And the best way to see it is not to put in all sorts of contrary claims, but to say, all right, very well, and push them out to be true to what they think. When I was a student, my own field is the social sciences, but as an undergraduate, one of the things I was very interested in was philosophy. And back in the early 60s, the influence of the Vienna Circle and logical positivism was still enormously powerful in the British universities. And particularly the thought of A.J. Eyre. And you know his radical notion of the verification principle. You had to judge types of claims, analytical claims, for instance, all bachelors are male, were accepted automatically because the end of the conclusion was written into the assumption, so that was accepted. But other claims had to be verified through the senses, the five senses, or they were dismissed as nonsense. So all religious claims, all metaphysics, was dismissed as nonsense. And as AJS said very famously, the word G-O-D is a great deal mean less meaningful than the word D-O-G. The dog is in the world of the five senses and can be empirically verifiable. God isn't, so God is nonsense. Then those of you who know philosophy know well what happened. His great verification principle itself could not be verified through the five senses. In other words, the principle itself was nonsense. Years later, when I was at Oxford and A.J. had retired, I found myself on the train with him for an hour one day, and we were chatting over his life, and he was then enormously distinguished professor, Sir Alfred A.J. Ayer, and so on, and he said to me, that whole verification principle of skepticism was a blind alley. He said, any debunker ought to be forced in public to wield his own debunking sword over his own cherished beliefs. And that's exactly right. He wielded his sword and wiped out all sorts of things, and then someone returned the favor, and his principle collapsed overnight. Relativize the relativizers, and don't let them get away with the cheating that they so often do. The second answer to the radical skeptics is more positive. What Peter Berger pulls, point out the signals of transcendence. They're skeptics. They're debunkers. They believe nothing. And yet, as Berger points out, embedded in their experience are things that point beyond their experience, are not allowed for within their experience. In other words, things which are contradictions of their experience and yearnings that point to something that goes way beyond their experience, signals of transcendence. Give you an example of this one. One of the great 20th century English speaking poets was W.H. Auden. 
He came to the United States in the late 1930s to escape the war in Europe and was happy to settle in Manhattan. Two months after the war broke out, he was in a cinema in Yorkville, Manhattan, an Upper East Side, which unbeknownst to him was a largely German-speaking audience in the Yorkville area. And he would go to the cinema every week to follow the documentaries, because there was no television in those days. And one particular day in November 1939, two months after the war broke out, the documentary was on the siege of Poland. Nazi stormtroopers are going in, bayoneting women and children, and the German-speaking audience, to be fair to them, they didn't know the death camps and so on, which we all know later, the German-speaking audience cried out, kill them, kill them, egging on the stormtroopers. Auden sat there in the darkness of the cinema, and he said in five minutes, his whole worldview was turned upside down. Two things just struck home immediately. The one was, there is evil in human nature. All his life, he said, he believed in the goodness of human beings and a bit better psychology and a little more education and improved political this, that, and the other, and we'd have the glories of good human beings coming out. He said, I just knew instinctively, seeing on the screen and seeing the audience reaction, there is evil in our human nature, including me, he said. He said, the second thing I saw instinctively, if I was to say that was evil, I had to have a standard by which to do so. I didn't have one. He said, I knew intuitively Hitler was absolutely evil. He said, I'd spent all my adult life as an intellectual destroying the absolutes. And now suddenly I needed one to be able to say that this was wrong. Have you ever heard an atheist say, God damn it, and really mean it? In other words, 99 times out of 100, that's just idle and blasphemous maybe. But even an atheist who confronts real evil will often intuitively, almost despite himself or herself, say, God damn it, they're not wrong, they're right. Some things are so profoundly wrong that you need a standard and an absolute standard by which to judge them. That's what Peter Berger calls a signal of transcendence, a contradiction of what Auden believed before and a yearning for what he didn't yet believe. Auden says, I left the cinema a seeker after an unconditional absolute and came to faith, pointing out the signals of transcendence. And you can see many people who are brave skeptics, radical skeptics, enormously proud of their debunking skills. Don't bother to give counter-arguments. Just relativize the relativizers. Or love them enough to be in their lives when the signals of transcendence go off and bleep and point beyond their lives. And you see some of these radical skeptics turning around and realizing how profoundly wrong they are and how precious truth is. One last point, the last pair. Truth and its double challenge to all of us. Now, I'm not talking about skeptics here, I mean all of us, including those of us who are people of faith who are openly and strongly committed to truth. Truth is very tough. At the heart of the biblical position, both for Jews and Christians, is the fact we are not only truth seekers, and unlike the East and unlike secularism, the biblical position has a, a framework for why human truth directedness is important. So notions say like trust and honesty in business, or integrity and truthfulness in journalism or character and truthfulness in political communication, whatever. All these things have a fundamental place, or just truth in science. All these things have a fundamental place in the biblical position, which because of the view of God, as I said earlier, has a powerful view of why human beings are truth-directed. But, the Bible points out, we're not just truth-seekers. We are truth-twisters. And you can see that the biblical ideal is not just that we speak for truth or that we 
fight for truth. But there is no final answer here unless we become people of truth and live in truth and act in truth. Now here you come across the real moral challenge of truth. Because as you look down the centuries of how thinkers have thought and related to truth, there are two ways we can go, and we're always all tempted by the two. One way is to try and shape the truth to our desires. The other way is to seek to shape our desires to the truth. Let's take the first, people who try and shape the truth to their desires. Here we are in one of America's, the world's great universities. Many people think that the intellectual is passionately and totally committed to truth. There have been many. The great hero in the social sciences, Max Weber, truth or nothing. And there are many others, Kierkegaard, Camus, many, many others had that passionate commitment to truth. They would follow truth wherever it leads, truth or nothing. But is that the general intellectual picture? Not in your life. The more sophisticated the education, the more sophisticated the potential for rationalization. The sharper the mind, the slipperier the heart. And the record of intellectuals, particularly in the modern world, is a very cautionary tale. Paul Johnson, among others, who tells it, says at the end of it, beware intellectuals. The most brazen example I know is Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, who died not far from here, he was still living when I first came here. If you read Huxley's story in his own book, Ends and Means, he says when he left Cambridge, he said he and his friends decided the world had no meaning. He says we were open about it. We decided, underline that word, we decided it had no meaning, not discovered it had no meaning, we decided it had no meaning, because if it had no meaning, we were free to make whatever meaning we wanted, sexually, politically, and other ways. And Huxley says quite openly in the book, for us, meaninglessness is a, quote, instrument of liberation. Not that he sought the truth and discovered this, that, and the other, but he decided it had no meaning in order to live his own particular life. And not surprisingly, as many have discovered, if you do that, in the short run, magnificent. Do your own thing. Make up your own reality. In the long run, because truth is this handle on reality by which we negotiate life, in the long run, Huxley and many others, confusion, and lostness. One of the key words for people who do this is the word that President Clinton made very popular, compartmentalize. You remember when Clinton explained that? He got it from his mother. If life had any part that was unpleasant, you cordoned it off as a separate compartment and lived as if it wasn't there. He used it positively. Most people would say that was behind the Saturday night bill, Sunday morning bill that Dick Morris and others described, the schizophrenic split-screen presidency, as ABC put it. Or put more simply, if you don't have integration with truth in the whole of your life, lack of integration is another word for lack of integrity. Shaping the truth to our desires. The alternative seeking to shape our desires to the truth. Unquestionably, in the short run, that's far less comfortable. I don't like the truth sometimes. It shows what I've just said is a lie, or I've morally fudged a principle, or whatever it is. Truth is uncompromising as reality is. And if I've crossed the line, fudged the principle, in the short run, that's very uncomfortable. In the long run, liberating. Because when one's life is aligned with reality, one's able to live humanly and freely. And here the word that contrasts with compartmentalism is a word very strong in both the Jewish and the Christian faith, the word confession. 
Michel Foucault is well known as a great postmodern thinker who hated the Christian faith. But Foucault acknowledges one thing about the Jewish and Christian faiths which he admired, confession. Why? N not coerced confession, but voluntary confession. Voluntary confession is actually an act of extraordinary moral rarity. Why? When a human being confesses, I was wrong. I did wrong. What we're doing is going on record publicly against ourselves, which in the short run is very painful, but in the long run is very healing and liberating. So truth is not an easy thing today. You can see that for the framers, Truth was one of those fundamentals without which this nation would not and could not remain free. And it's extraordinary how the last 30 years, many of the foundations that the framers would have considered essential have been blithely torn up or thrown away by so many. Both on the individual level and on the level of the republic, there is no freedom unless there is truth. Follow the argument through. Get however complicated you are through all the controversies, and you come back at the end of it, and what shows up with a stunning simplicity and clarity is that the words of Jesus of Nazareth were not a cliche, but extraordinarily profound. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm told that no other motto adorns more American university walls than that verse from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. America's tragedy today is that while the motto adorns the walls, it doesn't animate the minds. Truth, humanness, freedom. We're at a place where, put simply, the choices are ours. Your generation. Will you rethink and courageously go back? Or will you flow with the current skepticism of much of loose postmodernism? The choices are yours. But what I want to tell you tonight is, so also will be the consequences. Without truth, there's no freedom. Thank you, Oz. We're going to spend a few minutes doing question and answer. I ask two things of you. The first is that you would come up to the microphone. The second is that this would be a time of questions and not all of your answers. If you would like to talk to Oz afterwards, you may do so, but please keep your comments limited to the question at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oops, is this on? Okay. Thank you for being here tonight, uh, Dr. Guinness. So you've talked a little bit about where we've come, Western civilization. You talk a little bit about where we've come, where we are. Can you talk about maybe where you see us in the next five years, ten years, and also maybe compare North America with Western Europe, where Western Europe is, where North America is, in terms of the context to your talk? Well. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a futurist. Um, I think futurism is a quack science myself. So I won't say much about the future. Just one remark of where we are in relation to September the 11th. 
Clearly, one of the things that's been put on the map in a lot of discussion is the notion of civilizations and cultures and so on, including the power of religion. And if you look back just 10 years, the rough account of where we were was something like this. The 20th century had three great wars, the first, second, and the cold. It was a competition between three great ideologies, Nazism defeated, communism defeated, democratic liberalism, the victor. Now America is the sole superpower, the one indispensable nation. This is the end of history, you name it, and it rolled off. And suddenly we realized that's a very simplistic view. And when Bernard Lewis put the idea of the clash of civilizations, and it was picked up by Samuel Huntington, the original idea was to show Americans why our Western superiority would not be welcomed in many parts of the world, and to see what the social scientists call alternative modernities, that the Middle East wants to do it in Islamic style, India in Hindu style, and the Far East in Buddhist style, and so on. And this has become much more on the map, as I said. But here's the question that comes back. The realization that Islam plays this role, historically, culturally, and so on, in the Middle East, etc., raises the question, or oh, if that's their civilization, and that's the Indian one, and that's the Asian one, what's ours? And you remember, if you read Huntington, he put out the picture in terms of what he called the West versus the rest. And one of the people who came back to him, one of his own disciples academically, pointed out the real challenge is not the West versus the rest. The real challenge is the West versus itself. In the sense that you have powerful leadership elites in the West and in America who no longer believe what made the West the West and America, America. In other words, our Western civilization, Peter Berger puts it like this, he says, America is a nation of Indians ruled by Swedes. <laughs> in other words, India is the most religious nation in the world and the American people are as religious as India. Sweden is the most secular nation in the world and many of the American elites are as secular as Sweden. And you've got a schizophrenia. Not just out of touch with ordinary people, but out of touch with the wellsprings of our civilization. Now, it's quite clear historically that simply can't go on forever. So you could take a whole number of other planks. Truth is just one that's very fundamental. Another one would be character, all sorts of things. You could spin them out. The last generation has undermined so much that we are in danger of discarding the American experiment as the framers set it up. And that will have very important consequences down the line. I think if the present generation goes on another 20 years, I'm not going into the reasons why I say this, another 20 years, America will face inevitable decline because of those choices. But we needn't go that way. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, <clears throat> in relation to that question, because the framers had um, a Christian theology, and they were a lot of them were deists, um, do you believe that it was only possible what happened in America only really worked because it was based on the Ju Judeo-Christian foundation? And is it possible to happen again? Like say, like you were saying, with Islam, if they decide, okay, this is our truth and we're going to try to create you know, an integrateful system. Is it possible or is it only, did it only work because it was mm -hmm. Christianity? Well, let me give you my view. If you look at the framers, there's no question there was incredible diversity at two points. One, their own individual views of faith. The second, their views of what religion and public life should have been. So views of faith. I happen to be an Anglican and I worship at a church in Washington, which George Washington founded. Now, you had enormous range in the framers. John Jay was a Huguenot from France and an unreconstructed Protestant evangelical. Clearly, Washington was loosely orthodox and somewhat deist, but he wasn't a classic deist. What he called the invisible hand was God's providential interference in the revolution. But he never, for instance, you can see in the records of our church, he never ever went to communion. He, God, yes, Jesus, no. You go out to Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson was a great deal more skeptical still, and some, 
huge varieties so that weren't all, unlike the religious right says, they were not all pious people or orthodox, no question. Yeah, well, there were, some were orthodox, some were deists, and, and so on. But one thing I have never found a single variant on. They believed in what's being called the triangle of first principles, which puts very simply, freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith, and faith requires freedom, which requires virtue, and so on. Now, John Adams, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. And, and it, so it goes on. Now, if you look at the place of faith as it comes in, you can see the framers had all sorts of interesting ideas. But when Washington, probably uh, Alexander Hamilton, wrote the script, but when Washington called this the great experiment, what does he mean? Well, there's two places on which America is a gigantic wager or gamble. Put it like this. On the one hand, the republic requires ultimate beliefs. It requires them. Otherwise, there's no roots to the rights. On the other hand, the republic rejects any statement of what those ultimate beliefs are. There is no orthodoxy. There's no heresy. How do you bring those together? The republic requires them. The republic rejects anyone saying what they are. The only way you bring that together is the republic wages that in the free democratic debate, the best beliefs, the most human, the most true, the most just, etc., win the argument. And it's foreseeable in two ways that you might have trouble. One is if there are so many views that nobody cares about everything, you have such tolerance, it becomes indifference, we all just slump. And clearly parts of the country are towards that today. The other view is in the open pluralistic game, someone plays the game to get power who doesn't believe in pluralism and puts everyone else out of business. And if you've read the stuff of the extreme Islamism, not Islam, Islamism, they want to replace the constitution with a caliphate. And they're in essence openly trying to exploit pluralism to get the power to put others out. And another way of putting it is like this. Constitutionally, there's absolutely no limit to what anyone in America can believe. Is there? First Amendment. Constitutionally, no limit. Sociologically and culturally, there is a limit. As I've just said, you could have beliefs arise that endanger the whole thing. How do you bring that tension together? Once again, democratic debate. So, for instance, I think this is the one place the president misstepped. I'm not anti-Muslim, but we need to have a robust democratic debate. Why does Islam favor coercion, not persuasion? Why is their record so bad on human rights, democracy, religious liberty, persecution, etc.? We need a, a fair, robust debate. Peaceful, respectful, and persuasive, but robust. And the same is true with political correctness. You know, when political correctness stifles the debate, it smothers the public square, and we need to reintroduce people who believe in truth. We need to have a free debate about these things. Thank you. Um, I guess um, my question is, you talked a lot about um, truth, but... Um, Um, but I guess my question is, what is truth? I mean, when Jesus said, I, um, truth will sh uh, set you free, uh, was he talking about a general truth or something specific? We could discuss that theologically or, you know, more philosophically. To me, it's, I'm not a philosopher now, but it's interesting to me that when you go into the most abstruse philosophy, you actually get down at the end of the day to something very close to street level. And when you talk about telling the truth, you use phrases like telling it like it is. So that philosophically, we can say that a statement or an idea or a belief is true if what it's about is as presented in the statement. Now, we could get complicated in that philosophically. The essence of what Jesus was saying is very close to that because he was one who claimed to be the truth. And in the Gospel of John, he was saying his teaching 
was the truth, and the people who entered into that way would find that they were really close to the reality of what is and the way God intended human beings. So at the end of the day, there's no real clash between, you know, the philosophy and the theology. Of course, Jesus is the much more complete and the full, and he's talking specifically about his teaching. Yes, ma'am, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you give us some examples of the signals of transcendence you spoke of we could point out to skeptics in their lives? Some examples of signals of transcendence. Yeah. Um, Auden's at one. Well, that's a very negative one. We'll give you two more positive ones. The most famous one, probably, although it's not a universally uh, understood one, is C.S. Lewis. Lewis was an Ulsterman, and if any of you know Ulsterman, my family comes from the south, not the north, Ulsterman are really dogmatic, ordinary people, and he was that as an atheist. When Lewis became a seeker, he called himself a lapsed atheist, and it was a signal of transcendence that got him pried loose from his atheism, starting to search, and it's what he called being surprised by joy. And Lewis says, take experiences of real joy. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is circumstances. That's easy. It's not pleasure. Pleasure is the five senses, sensual and so on. Joy is something else. As Nietzsche says, joy wills eternity. And Lewis said he had these experiences again and again of what he called unsatisfied desires, which were more desirable than any satisfaction. So these experiences of joy broke into his life, and he began to search for the source of this joy. And he realized that any secular explanations and part of his atheism just didn't wash, and he became a seeker. Now, how he found is, a, is another story which you can read. But for him, those experiences of joy, there's always this double thing, the contradiction and the yearning. The joy was so intense, it contradicted all his secular explanations and left him a yearning for the source of joy, which made him a seeker, and he went on till he found. Another example is the great British journalist G.K. Chesterton. If you know his story, in the 1890s, he went to the Slade School of Art, and which was actually very like a postmodern world today. It was bitter, ironical, skeptical, debunking, and he was fascinated with the occult and the macabre and the dark and so on. And he said he was about to buy into the whole pessimistic philosophy of life. But one thing stopped him philosophically his gratitude to be alive. He said, I was stopped in my tracks by a dandelion. It was so beautiful. It wasn't a sunset or a Mozart sonata or the Taj Mahal. The beauty of a simple dandelion and gratitude to be alive. So he said, whatever meaning I found in life had to explain both why the world had somehow gone badly wrong, but at the heart of it was this incredible wonder of existence. And he said gratitude contradicted the pessimism, and he had to find a reason for it, and he became a seeker. It was his signal of transcendence. So Auden's was what Berger calls the argument from damnation, the need to make a judgment. That's much more negative. Berger's, I mean, um, Lewis's, joy, Chesterton's, gratitude. Those are signal. But you see the same thing in each of the three. Contradiction of what they once believed, and a yearning, here's the signal of transcendence, bleeping up, pointing beyond what they now believe, and they become seekers and follow it. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I have one question. I'm going to phrase it first sort of like philosophically, and then I'm going to put it in like a biblical context. And it's that you said um, Christianity isn't true because it works it works because it's true. And so my question would be, what if it doesn't work? And then put in a biblical context, what, what, is, what is someone like Job's faith worth to Job? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to have a full discussion of what we mean by working. And the follower of Jesus does not claim to have all the answers. You know, a lot of people pretend that they do. And the deepest of all the human questions where our answers are limited, 
is in evil and pain and suffering. The two, well, you could give a lot of answers to this, but one way I'd put one of the main strands of a biblical answer is in terms of a famous parable in philosophy, the parable of the resistance fighter. It's actually put out by one of our Oxford professors who was a strong man of faith when there was hardly any faith in Oxford philosophy. But it sort of runs like this. Say this is World War II in France, and I come to Bianca in a bar, and I say, look, I gather you want to join the resistance. I'm the local resistance leader. We have two hours to talk tonight. Check out anything you like. Ask me any question. But if you sign on after tonight, you'll obey me blind, and you'll often be in the dark. Sometimes it's obvious what my instructions are, what I'm doing. Sometimes it won't be. I may be in Gestapo uniform arresting him, and you won't know that I'm releasing him out of sight. You'll just have to trust. And the philosophical parable points out that is the challenge of a believer in a fallen world. We don't always know what's happening. Now, checking out the credentials, there are two parts to that. There are two fundamental religious, spiritual, philosophical questions. Is God there? his existence. And is God good, his character? Those who know the answers to that have the credentials, as it were, they can walk in the dark. For the followers of Jesus, both of those are answered in him. Where do we see most strongly that we know God is there in Jesus? Where do we see most undeniably that God is good in Jesus, who loved us so much he even went to the cross? Now, that means we know why we trust God, but we still don't know why God is doing what he's doing. And that's very important. So there are lots of areas the Christian doesn't have all the answers. Abraham is called to sacrifice his son. He didn't know why God wanted him to do that, but he knew why he trusted God who knew why. And so in the dark, he knew the resistance leader knew what he was doing. So this notion of it doesn't work, we have to be very, very careful about the sort of questions we're asking. The Christian faith is very clear about the things we are clear about, and they're fundamental. So we're not agnostics. But if you ask me questions about why September the 11th, or why did God create knowing that, dot, 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 I can't answer that. After the war's over, the resistance leader We'll divulge all the secrets and break the codes and so on. But here now, often we're following in the dark. We don't know why X, Y, and Z, but we know why we trust God who knows why, and that's fundamentally different. Yes, ma'am. I think I'm misunderstanding something about the definition of skeptics. Um, if I look at something like the Skeptical Inquirer, which is sort of a magazine of skeptics, it seems that they're at the other extreme from postmodern people because what they want to do is they want to find the facts and they want to find the truth in a sense, but not the faith, uh, belief. So it seems to me that if you're looking for skeptics, they're sort of seekers, but they're looking at truth. Mm -hmm. And the question, and, and so because they're looking for facts and they're saying, well, you know, if somebody bends a fork, is it the laws of physics that are bending the fork or is it mm -hmm. some magical? fact, yeah. which is very different from postmodernism, which would say that it wasn't, there was no truth there. Mm -hmm. So, oh, a good point. Um, good point. In other words, there are confused. a lot of things in the world we live in about which we should be highly skeptical. Absolutely. So just as there is a very important place for saying when we don't know, in other words, there's a, there's a genuine agnosticism of faith when it comes to some of the mysteries of evil, so there's a very, very important point of believing skepticism. Everything should be looked at, examined, challenged, sometimes doubted. Now, I was talking about the much more radical skepticism that tries to be skeptical about everything. Now, if you look over the history of human thought, there are periods of pretty extreme skepticism. We're, we're living in one today. You can look back to the Greek sophists and so on. Now, there's a simple reason why most periods of human history are not radically skeptic. We can't live like that. So we're in a skeptical age, and I often say to my friends, it will pass for the simple reason no one can live like that. And much of postmodernism 
is so negative, you couldn't build a family on the radical postmodernism. You certainly can't build or sustain a nation. But a genuine skepticism that's born of inquiry, curiosity, a Socratic style, that's wonderful. So um, certainly I'm not uh, attacking that. Thank you. Yes, sir. You mentioned <clears throat> the steps which we can take, you know, relativizing the relativism and also pointing out the signals of transcendency. But is the fight for truth a losing battle or is, in another sense, is the search for truth inevitably irreconcilable with the religious diversity seen in the world today? Um, there is no greater diversity religiously in the world today than there's ever been. It's just, as the social scientists say, everyone is now everywhere. In other words, you had all the variety there, but now they're all here, as it were. <laughs> so, you know, further south, you have Californian schools with 90 religions in one school. Now, another way of putting it, there's all, gosh, I don't know which way to go with that. There's so many things that come out of that. I, I, obviously, I speak as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian. The Christian faith has no fear of diversity or pluralism. The church was born in an extraordinary era of pluralism, but it was persuasive in its living and its speaking, and it became very powerful in that world. So the Christian is not afraid of it. What I resist today is the kind of politically correct views, and let me just take one. The New York Times position, which was first articulated by Tom Friedman, the author of The Olive Tree and the Lexus, around Thanksgiving last year, ran like this, picking up on what you say about diversity. The problem in America is not terrorism, it's religious totalitarianism. And the religious totalitarians aren't just the Muslims, they're the Jews and the Christians. Anyone who believes in an absolute or an exclusive truth. Instead of that, he said, what we need is a multilingual ideology of pluralism, where no one believes anything absolute. Well, there's a number of fallacies that underlie that. The first is pluralism is not an ideology. Pluralism is simply a fact. There are a lot of people with a lot of different views out there. Diversity, pluralism are not ideologies, they're facts. The ideology is relativism. That is more pernicious. Another answer to that is Friedman's wrong that it's Orthodox Jews and classical Christians who have absolutes and nobody else. Atheism is an absolute faith. For example, all the atheists I know would say, there is no God, and if you believe in God, you're believing in what's a myth. They don't say, there is no God for me, but I believe there's a God for you. They believe absolutely that if anyone else believes in God, they're wrong, and it's a projection, a wish fulfillment, or whatever it is. The real question is not this ideology of pluralism. The real question is today, how do we live with our deep differences when many of those differences, including atheism and secularism, are absolute? How do we live with our deepest differences when many of the differences are absolute? That's the question America faces and needs to be thought through. Now, there are many Christian answers to this on the public level, I believe that we should argue not for a sacred public square where any religion is preferred, like Protestantism used to be, not for a naked public square where they're all excluded but secularism gets through the back door. I believe we should argue for a civil public square where every faith, whether atheist, Mormon, Jew, Christian, Muslim, you name it, every faith has the freedom to enter public life and engage public life on the basis of their own faith but within a shared framework, what Lippmann calls a public philosophy, within a shared framework of what is just and free for everybody. Now, America hasn't got that. It's collapsed. That's why the president's faith-based initiatives are going nowhere. They've just got caught in the culture wars from either side. We lack this framework of what's just and free for everybody. On the individual level, individual people of faith need to be a lot more persuasive. If there's a hundred different positions in the room, rather than three, they need to know how to relate to a hundred different positions, and many of them can't. Or put differently, there's an apologetic dimension to all public discourse today. 
you, uh, do you want to press that a bit further? I, I just picked up. My fear of September the 11th is religion came front and center, but negatively. And in the long run, the public square is more frozen over than it was before. So now the place of religion and civilization is pretty widely acknowledged, but it's said to be negative. That's disastrous for democracy. Yes, sir. I uh, apologize ahead of time for a uh, leading yeah. question. Um, to what extent do you think that wealth and power are inevitably opposed to truth? And maybe uh, to, you said this was your favorite play, your favorite university. If you could give a special answer for us. As, a, as, an institution, <laughs> as an institution of wealth and, and power and privilege. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Obviously, though, in terms of what I was saying about people who want to shape the truth to their desires, wealth and power are the vested interests which make people do that. In other words, truth becomes a tool. You know, in my field of social sciences, ideology has a very technical meaning. And most people use ideology just as a you know, set of ideas. But in the social sciences, ideology is a set of ideas which is a weapon for social interests. In other words, people with wealth, with power, will tempt to use any ideas in order to cement their positions, including the manipulation of truth. Now, you can look at the records, say, of the Clinton administration, just to take a recent one. You know, clearly, Clinton was not just the first baby boomer president. He was the first postmodern president. And the notion of truth and power is very, very clear in the White House communications. So, you know, the day that Dick Morris comes in and says, Mr. President, my polls show that they'll forgive you if you're adultery, etc., but not this. Clinton's famous response, we shall just have to win then. And the idea in law, there's no justice or truth. It's just whoever has the best attack dogs, read James Carville, the best dream team lawyers, etc., etc., wins because even truth is a matter of manipulation in the name of wealth and power. Now, that's exceedingly, exceedingly dangerous for poor people. And any of us who care for the poor and needy knows that you have to have standards of justice and truth that are higher than ideology and higher than just wealth and power. So your point's a very important one. Now, where St Stanford stands currently, I have no idea. So I'm not just uh, slipping out of it. I, I, I'm genuinely ignorant. Clearly, Stanford's had its own fair share of some pretty wild ideas at times in, in the postmodern area, many of which are thoroughly pernicious. I, I, I trust they've all disappeared. <laughs> One more. Okay. The other night, a scientist, a physicist here at Stanford, gave us two signs of transcendence out there. The origin of the cosmos a finite time, time ago, the Big Bang, and the fine-tuning of the universe are both signs. I, he, he didn't use those, those terms. Looking inward, do you think the conscience is a sign of transcendence that accuses us and, and points to our imperfection? And is that, an um, important, is that an important sign? Well, sign it's not the story? conscience that's the, uh, that itself is the sign of transcendence. It's the judgments that we instinctively make because of conscience. In other words, there isn't a human being on the earth who doesn't make moral judgments. You're wrong. You're right. You ought to do this. That's unjust. This is unfair. We're, we're constantly making moral judgments. You can't get away from it. And it's that act, what does that assume and require? That's the W.H. Auden one. So it, it's the judgment itself that's intuitive and inescapable that is the signal of transcendence. Now, you can say it's rooted in conscience, but conscience itself is not. I wouldn't point to conscience because, as we all know, conscience to some extent can be culturally conditioned. You know, so you can find tribes anthropologically and West Aryan Jaya, where the highest value is treachery, literally. So I, I, I read stories of uh, the so-called story Peace Child, which is a wonderful description in this particular tribe that valued treachery. When a Western missionary went and told the story of Jesus and the disciples, they all applauded Judas. 
and thought Jesus was a sucker. <laughs> no, so you can profoundly condition conscience, although it will still be there. There are some things that can't not be known. There are some judgments that can't not be made. But I think it's the intuitive act of judgment or the flash of judgment. That's the signal, not actually conscience itself. Even though, though, let me, let me follow it up, up here. Even though their conscience may have been perverted and treachery suddenly becomes a, a virtue, doesn't their conscience still accuse them? Doesn't everybody think that yeah, they're imperfect? Tribe, there, were, there, were, there were other ways in which they communicated. They had, they had to figure it out. And it, was a, it was a real challenge. Uh, but he figured it out. And, and there's no one who doesn't have something down there that's profoundly human and intuitive about right, wrong, and humanness, and so on. Absolutely. Good. Thank, thank you. Great pleasure to be with you. Oh, we're going to take the last. Nope. Oh, no, sorry. Just a small question of clarification, but maybe an important one at the sure. an institution of higher learning. Learning, you said um, the sharper the mind or the intellect, the slipperier the heart. What do you perceive as the correct relation between the life of the spirit and the life of the mind, if it is so fraught with peril or with sophistry? I mean, is not the, the, the tendency of a fool to avoid truth just as dangerous as the tendency of a wise person to do that? You know, when Václav Havel and the Charter 77 movement, truth prevails for those who live in truth. It, it actually goes back to Jan Masaryk, the Czech philosopher. But of course, it goes far further back to the New Testament. And you have the idea of not only living in truth, but walking in the light. And for instance, in the letter of John, you know, John says, God is light. And if we're living lies, we're kidding ourselves, and we're walking in darkness. And the only way to really live in truth and walk in the light is to live before the character of God. Now, that's easy to say theologically, but you can see we all need help to do that. And one of the simpler ways you can see down through history is accountability. So in the Old Testament, the notion of courage ability, we need to be corrected by each other, or the great Saint Augustine, he says, I have my true brothers who love me whatever I do, and they rejoice when things go well, and they grieve with me when they go badly, and they're prepared to confront me on the basis of truth, and all of us are slippery. You know, none of us is absolutely honest. We all try and deceive ourselves at some point, and so we need the ultimate standard, the character of God under which we walk, but we also need human challenges as mid-course correction to keep us in line, because it's easy to say these things and just leave them as cliches. Truth is not just academic. Truth is not just philosophical and theoretical. Truth is moral, truth is spiritual, truth is personal, and truth is mighty tough. Because there's nothing we get away with, and someone sees us when no one else sees us, and to live in that way is the toughest moral challenge you can have intellectually or otherwise. Thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.